بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وخاتم النبيين محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد Respected listeners, <coughs> last week I spoke in some detail about the Prophet Sallallahu relationship with children. Not just the children of his family, not just his own children, but his love, affection and compassion and friendliness, and in fact even playfulness with all children. Today, inshallah, I hope to share a few thoughts about the Prophet Wasallam's relationship with his family and also in general about his life inside his house at home. The topic isn't as focused, or I can't make the topic today as focused on, as focused as it was last week. Last week the topic was very specific, his relationship with children. <coughs> when we speak about his family life in general, that could in include so many different things. His relationship with children, his relationship with his wives, his behavior at home in the privacy of his four walls, his timings at home, his personal habits. So I'll try to say as much as I can which would enable us to gain some insight or to be reminded of the Prophet Wasallam's private life and how we can learn from it. <coughs> Prophet Sallallahu was a very balanced individual and this balance showed in his private life too. One of the remarkable things of the Prophet Sallallahu was how much he was in tune with nature. And that reflected in his timings throughout the day. Prophet would rise early, spend the day in activity, and then by nightfall, it was his noble habit to retire to sleep. Staying awake late at night has always been the habit of human beings, especially when people get together. So in festivity, celebration, in family gatherings, or just as a group of people spending time together, they would while away the early hours of the night in discussion, in dialogue and conversation, often just idle talk. The Prophet Sallallahu this is referred to as Samar in Arabic. And in the Hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu has specifically warned against this. He's forbidden it. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum relate that the Prophet Sallallahu would forbid Samar, which means conversing late into the night. And he forbade others from doing so 
and he practiced it perfectly himself. So if the Prophet وسلم, ate in the evening, it would normally be after Maghrib Salah. And then immediately after Isha, immediately, the wives of the Prophet وسلم, say that when he would return from Isha Salah, if he needed to discuss something with a member of the family, he would do so. That's only if it was a pressing matter. Otherwise, without speaking, without conversation, the Prophet ﷺ would immediately retire to bed and he would fall asleep. And one of the reasons for doing so, apart from the fact that he was very much in tune with nature, is that the Prophet ﷺ would sleep early, and then he would rise in the middle of the night for the Hajj. Those are the most serene moments of the 24 hours. And in those special hours, the Prophet ﷺ would rise and spend a very long time in prostration, in prayer, in standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha says that he was told, she said to him, that O Messenger of Allah, why do you burden yourself in this manner? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would remain standing in the hajjad for so long that his feet would swell. It would swell and crack. So the Umm al Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha says that, O oh, Messenger of Allah, why do you burden yourself in such a manner when Allah has indeed forgiven all your sins, past and future? So the Prophet wasallam's reply was, Afala akunu abdan shakura. Should I then not be a grateful servant to Allah? So without being in need of it, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would spend every single night without fail in the Hajjud Salah for a very long time, standing, praying, weeping. And Umm Mu'mineen Aisha Radiallahu Anha, as well as the other wives, would often be asleep. But on occasions, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would wake up the wives too, and members of his family. Sayyidina Ali radiyallahu an relates that it's a hadith of Bukhari that once Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam came to our house, to his daughter's house, in the middle of the night, this is for tahajjud. So he rose for tahajjud himself and then he went to his daughter's house to wake up both his daughter Fatima radiyallahu anha and his son-in-law Ali radiyallahu And speaking of family, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married his cousin brother Ali radiyallahu to his daughter. So, but he wasn't just a son-in-law and he wasn't just a cousin brother. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually grew up with him one. Another thing, of course, he was much, much, much younger, but the Prophet ﷺ spent a lot of time with him. And then eventually, when the Prophet ﷺ married Khadijah and Allah enriched him through her, the Prophet ﷺ then, in order to lighten the burden of his uncle Abu Talib, he actually took Ali into his care and custody. So he, he would care for him, maintain him, and he would provide for him, and he would live with him. So Ali was, like a, was a cousin brother, a son-in-law, a brother, and like a son to the Prophet 
And that's why they were both very much devoted to each other. So the Prophet وسلم, went to their house at night, at the Hajjah time. And Ali radiallahu an says that he woke us up. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went home and he began his tahajjud salah himself. And then realizing that there was total silence, because we were very close, there was total silence from his daughter's house, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came back and woke them up again. So Ali radiallahu an, and this is additional wording from uh, other narrations, not from Bukhari, but from others, including Imam Nasayi, Tabarani, etc. So Ali radiallahu anhu says that I sat up, and whilst I was rubbing my eyes, I said, to, I remonstrated with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he had woken us up twice, and he probably rebuked them the second time, <coughs> mildly. Ali radiallahu anhu said that our souls are in the control of Allah. Our souls are in the hands of Allah. If Allah wishes, he lets us sleep. If Allah wishes, he allows us to wake up. But the Prophet Wasallam's humility, his calmness, his composure, his forbearance was such that even though Ali radiallahu an said this to him, the Prophet Wasallam remained silent. He didn't say anything to him in reply. And he began walking away. And as he was walking away, the Prophet ﷺ slapped his noble thigh and loudly exclaimed, he recited the verse of the Qur'an, وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ أَكْثَرَ شَيْءٍ جَدَلًا That man is argumentative in most things. Or of all things, man is the most argumentative. So even Ali radiallahu an, he actually employed an argument from the Qur'an where Allah refers to Allah يَتْوَفَّ الْأَنفُسَ حِينَ مَوْتِهَا وَالَّتِي لَمْ تَمُتْ فِي مَنَامِهَا فَيُمْسِكُ الَّتِي قَضَى عَلَيْهِ الْمَوْتَ وَيُرْسِلُ الْأُخْرَى إِلَىٰ أَجْلٍ مُسَمَّى That Allah, He is the one who seizes the souls at the time of their death. And He also seizes those who have not yet died in their sleep. Then in sleep, he withholds, he holds on to those souls upon whom he has decreed death. And the other souls, he releases them till a fixed time. So sleep is lesser death. Sleep is a lesser death. And death is a great sleep. And our whole life is but a dream. It really is. When we, when we are dreaming, there is no one, apart, apart from on some occasions, when some people can experience lucid dreaming, but apart from a few people, again on some occasions, who realise that they are actually dreaming because they are drifting in and out of sleep. For most people on most occasions, or when you are in deep sleep, when you are actually dreaming properly, you really think that that's, that's all there is. That is life. That's reality. And sometimes in our dreams we actually question ourselves, am I dreaming? And in dreams, we experience going to sleep and dreaming within a dream. So when we are dreaming, we think there is nothing else. This is reality. This is all there is. When we wake up, it's something else altogether. In fact, most people can't remember their dreams. As soon as you wake up, Scientifically, they explain that most often you can only, again on most occasions, you can only remember the dreams that you saw in the last few minutes before waking up. Otherwise, a person can dream for hours intermittently and not remember anything. So, life is but a dream. And when we will wake up from this dream, 
that will be the reality. And then nothing will matter of this dream, how rich we were, how poor we were, what we suffered. Nothing will matter. And it may all just seem like a horrible dream, an unpleasant dream. So sleep is the lesser death, and death is a great sleep. So Ali radiallahu anhu was referring to that when he says that our, hand, our souls are in the hands of Allah. If Allah wishes, he may re- withhold on to them. He may hold on to them. If Allah wishes, he may release them, allowing us to wake up and pray. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left, turned, and walked away, and slapping his thigh, he, said, he recited the verse of the Qur'an that indeed man is in most things the most argumentative, or the most argumentative of all things. And that's man's nature to debate, to discuss. But the Prophet ﷺ said that. For us, the moral of the story is, see the relationship with the, of the Prophet ﷺ with his family. He loved them. He cared for them. But his primary concern for his family was not food and drink, was not the comforts and the luxuries of this world. It was salah. And Allah tells him that in the Qur'an. وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْتَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا لَا نَسْأَلُكَ رِزْقَ نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكَ وَالْعَاقِبُتِ لِلتَّقْوَى Allah says, and command your family to prayer. Instruct your family about prayer. And be firm and perseverant and steadfast upon salah, upon prayer. Then Allah immediately says, لَا نَسَلُكَ رِزْقًا We do not ask you for provisions. We do not ask you for any sustenance. نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكَ We will sustain you. And this is similar to the other verse of the Qur'an in which Allah Azza wa Jal says, مَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْقٍ وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الرَّزَّاقُ ذُو الْقُوبَةِ الْمَتِينَ I have not created man and jinn, except that they serve me. I do not seek any provision or any sustenance from them. Nor do I seek that they feed me. Indeed, Allah, He is the supreme sustainer. The one of might, the Almighty. So, here are two verses, two very separate verses of the Qur'an, which both begin with ibadah, in the case of one, and ibadah shouldn't be restricted to the narrow meaning of ritual worship, but rather the all-encompassing meaning of serving Allah. That's what ibadah means. So the one verse begins with ibadah, i.e. serving Allah. And the other verse begins with salah, with prayer. And although both verses begin with this, they immediately switch to the message by Allah that Allah does not want his creation or even the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to provide for him, to feed him, to sustain him. Rather, he is a supreme sustainer. He is the one who feeds and provides. What's the connection between the first part of the verse and the second? In both cases. Why specifically mention that Allah does not depend on the creation? And Allah does not seek any risk, any sustenance, or provision, or even feeding from the creation. Rather, he is the one who looks after them, provides for them, and feeds them. The reason for both verses, beginning in that manner and immediately switching to this message, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though simplistic though it may seem to us, is reminding us that we, we live our lives, we, we earn, we work, and we strive, and we make the goal and the purpose of our lives the accumulation of wealth, and in such a manner as though it suggests that
that we are trying to gather and accumulate wealth in order to provide for and feed not just ourselves and not just our families and not just the rest of creation but Allah the Creator Himself. And this diverts us from our true purpose of the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of serving Allah. If one parent or if an employer, if an employer tells his employee that I'd like you to carry out this particular task, the employee then goes off acting on his or her own initiative to do something else in order to curry favour with the employer. and fails to fulfill clear instructions. Even though ultimately the employee may protest that I did it for your sake, out of interest for you, for your welfare, the employer will immediately dismiss such an employee. If a parent instructs a child to do something which the parent feels is vital for the child's well-being, their health, and for the family. The child then goes off and repeatedly does something else, well-intentioned though it may be, a thing which ultimately harms not just the child but the rest of the family. What will be the reaction of the parents? Despite the sincerity and the well-intention, uh, the sincerity and the noble intentions of the child, similarly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is our creator, he knows us, he has molded us, he has fashioned us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us that I have created you to serve me. That is your purpose, that's your duty, that's your goal and objective. Do not be distracted from that. Do not let anything divert you from that. And then... When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees his creation, running off, earning in order to provide for themselves and earning in such a manner as though they need to provide, not just for themselves and their families and the, whole, and the rest of creation, but even for the creator himself. That's how they live, that's how they work. It's endless, it's never ending. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the creation repeatedly in the Qur'an, don't forget your purpose. Don't forget your objective. Your true purpose is to serve me. And part of that is salah. Do not let your earning and your livelihood distract you from that. I will sustain you. I will provide for you. And don't act as though you have to provide for me. I don't want you to feed me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam specifically, wa'mur, the address is it to him individually, wa'mur ahlaka bis salati wa stabir alayha. That, O Messenger of Allah, instruct your family to prayer and remain firm and steadfast and perseverant upon it. So this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to do with his children, with his family. And that's what he did on that occasion. He went to Fatima radiallahu anha's house, woke them up, returned for the Hajj. He continued to pray his Tahajjud Salah. When he sensed total silence, he went back, woke them up again. When Ali radiallahu anha sat up rubbing his eyes and remonstrated with him, not uh, passionately, but just argued his case that, O oh, Messenger of Allah, our souls are in the hands of Allah. Allah lets us sleep as he wishes and Allah lets us wake as he wishes. Prophet sallallahu turned around and without saying another word to Ali radiallahu an, just slapping his thigh and loudly exclaiming that indeed man is in most things argumentative. But the moral of the story for us is that this was the Prophet sallallahu relationship with his family. He was more concerned about their prayer, about their worship, about their ibadah and their relationship with Allah rather than their worldly affairs. Fatima radiallahu anha went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because Ali radiallahu an worked extremely hard. They were the royal family. But has there ever been a royal family like this? 
where Fatima radiallahu anha, the princess, her hands were rough out of excessive work. Where she suffered and laboured in order to feed herself and her family. And she lived in an humble abode. Ali radiallahu an carried water on his shoulders. He did all sorts of manual work. Ali radiallahu an used to carry water. Ali radiallahu an used to gather bundles of straw on his back. Ali radiallahu an used to do all kinds of different work, all of it just to feed the family. Ali radiallahu an would tell Fatima radiallahu anha, Fatima radiallahu anha would tell Ali radiallahu an, speak to your father-in-law, speak to my father, so that he provides us with a maid or some help, so that our burden can be lightened. Ali radiallahu an had burdened his back. Fatima radiallahu anha had through extensive labor made her hands coarse and rough and they were both suffering. Event Ali radiallahu anhu would refrain from speaking to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Eventually Fatima radiallahu anha went. Fatima radiallahu anha spoke to the father and said, Oh father, this is our condition at home. This is our livelihood. These are my hands. This is how I labor. This is how my husband, your cousin brother, labors. Give us a maid from the wealth that the Muslims have received. Prophet Sallallahu heard her petition, heard everything that she had to say. And then this was the ruler of Arabia saying to his daughter, the princess of the royal family, if we can call it that, I'm just saying it for explanatory reasons. What did the father say? What did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? Oh child, I give you something far better. And what did he give her? The speech. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. That was his relationship with his family. Not wealth. He did not want wealth at home. He didn't. He lived a simple life. That's what he wanted for his entire family. He went to the house of his daughter, Fatima radiallahu anha. He saw a pattern. He saw patterns on the blanket that served as a door. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa turned around and went home. Ali radiallahu anhu returned Fatima radiallahu anha informed Ali radiallahu anha that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa came, but he turned back right from the door. Ali radiallahu anha became fearful. That was this out of displeasure. He went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He inquired, O Messenger of Allah, you came, yet you turned back at the door. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, I saw a pattern which distracted me and reminded me of the dunya. So I turned back. Ali radiallahu anhu went home, informed Fatima radiallahu anha of what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had just said and the reasons he had given for turning back from the door. Instantly Fatima radiallahu anha, she decided to dispose of that blanket. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa encouraged her to give it to a certain family. <laughs> The Prophet ﷺ acted on that verse that instruct your family to pray and be perseverant and patient on it. We do not seek any assistance or provision from you. Rather, we shall sustain you. That's what he did with Fatima radiallahu anha. That's what he did with his grandchildren. One of the Hassanain, either Hassan or Hussein radiallahu anhuma, was playing by a heap of dates. When the Prophet ﷺ received zakah, that wealth of zakah, or even kharaj, that would be deposited in the masjid, but only for a short while, before it was empty. And on this occasion, or sometimes even in the house of the Messenger ﷺ, some small amounts, so, 
dates were the dates of sadaqah, of charity, were placed in the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a huge pile. One of the grandchildren, Hassan Hussein radiyallahu anhuma, came and like a child, he picked up one of the dates and put it in his mouth. Allahu Akbar. Although I spoke about children last week and the Prophet Sallallahu relationship with them, I never mentioned this story. So, he picked up the date and put it in his mouth. Rasulullah Sallallahu left a lifelong lesson for us about how to teach our children and how to strike the balance when it comes to halal and haram, when it comes to a child's relationship with the dunya and with Allah Azza wa Jal. The perfect balance. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called him and said to him that this, these dates are from sadaqah. And sadaqah is haram for our family. The Banu Hashim. And the reason Sadaqah is haram for Banu Hashim, not just the Prophet Sallallahu immediate family, but going back two, three generations. So Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib, the son of Hashim, his great grandfather. The reason is that Sadaqah, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةٌ تُطَهِرُهُمْ وَتَسَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا وَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ That O Messenger of Allah, take from their wealth, such charity, such Sadaqah, that which purifies them, and through which you purify them, you nurture them. So when we give Zakah and Sadaqah, when we give Zakah, Zakah purifies our wealth. It's a cleanser. So the amount of wealth that we extract from our zakah, it cleanses and purifies the rest of the wealth. So it's in a way, it's a cleansing, it's a financial cleansing agent. That thing, that portion of wealth, which cleans and purifies other people's wealth, is not befitting the Prophet ﷺ and his purity, or his family. And so, for the Banu Hashim, there is no, the consumption of zakah or sadaqah is not permissible. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, these are the dates of sadaqah and such wealth is haram for us. So he taught him that. And then, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? Did he simply, well, we may think it's just a child. It's okay. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whilst explaining this to him, he held, his, he held the grandchild's face and then he opened his mouth gently and whilst talking to him, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam removed as much of the dates with his noble fingers from the child's mouth as he could. So he explained to him lovingly, but at the same time, he did his utmost to ensure that no haram enters his grandchild's body. Halal and haram are very important. Not just food, but especially income, especially wealth. And there are countless stories of halal and haram. Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, his son, Muhammad ibn Is- well, uh, sorry, Imam Bukhari, alayhi, his father, his name was Ismail. And Imam Ismail, he was a narrator of hadith himself. And this was the respect that people had for ulama. Proudly, Imam Bukhari would say, and he would tell people, he would recall who my father was. He wouldn't say, my father was this and my father was that. Rather, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi, would tell people that my father, he heard hadith from Malik. Meaning my father had the privilege and the honor of hearing hadith from Imam Malik. And then he went further and he would say, my father, 
he shook hands with Imam Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak with both hands. For him, that was a thing of honor. So Imam Ismail, the father of Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, he left his two sons, Muhammad and Ahmed. Ahmed was the older one. When he passed away, before he passed away, when he was on his deathbed, he said, I have left so much wealth for these two sons of mine. By Allah, in my entire collection of wealth, I do not know of a single dirham which is of a doubtful nature. Forget haram, he said, which is of a doubtful nature. It's pure wealth which breeds pure people. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told his grandchild, this wealth is haram for us. But at the same time, he very lovingly and affectionately, he removed every trace of that date from the child's mouth. That's what he was concerned about. He did not want wealth, even halal wealth, inside his house. One day after, salah, after Asr Salah, Sahaba radiallahu anhum relate that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam suddenly stood up. Like a bolt, he stood up and he rapidly made his way from the front of the masjid to his house. Later, we asked him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, was everything well? Was everything okay? You did this, you suddenly rose after Asr Salah and you went home. This is something we're not accustomed to, it's unprecedented. Prophet Wasallam replied, yes, everything's fine. All that it was that during Salah, I remembered a gold nugget that was inside my house, that of Sadaqah, of the wealth of Sadaqah. So it wasn't gold belonging to him. Again, remember I said earlier that when Zakah would come, or Sadaqah, the wealth would sometimes be placed in the masjid, or it would be placed in the house of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like when the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sent someone to collect the zakah of Bahrain. And today we know Bahrain to be, an, to be an island. But in those days, whenever we read Bahrain in the uh, hadith or in classical Islamic literature, Bahrain refers to not just the island, which was a small part of that region, but it refers to the whole eastern part of Arabia, inland. So when it says Bahrain, that's what's being referred to, the easternmost part of the Arabian Peninsula. So the Prophet wasallam sent someone to collect the zakah and the taxes of Bahrain. So when they were brought, and it was a fertile, wealthy region, the, the wealth was collected and again placed in the masjid. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum heard, and... Many of them attended Fajr Salah. So the Prophet وسلم, rose after Fajr, turned around, and was about to return home when he saw the congregation. And the wealth of Bahrain was there to one side of the masjid, glittering. Prophet وسلم, smiled at and remember, they were, many of them were in need. Despite their poverty and their need, imagine, imagine the scene. The Prophet wasallam says to them, Wallahi mal faqr akhsha alaykum, walakinni akhsha an tubsat dunya alaykum kama bustat ala man kana qablakum, fatanafasuha kama tanafasuha, fatuhlikakum kama ahlakatum. That by Allah, it is not poverty. He smiled and he said this. By Allah, it is not poverty that I fear for you. Rather, what I do fear for you, that the world shall be opened up and spread out before you as it was opened up to those who came before you. Then the world will destroy you just as it destroyed them. Sorry, the world will be opened up for you as it was opened up for those who came before you, Meaning, you will then vie with each other and compete with one another in acquiring the world just as they competed and vied with one another. And then the world will destroy you just as it destroyed them. So, sometimes a sadaqah would be placed in the masjid, sometimes in the house. So again, there was a golden nugget 
of the wealth of Sadaqah. So the Prophet وسلم, rose immediately after Salah, rushed home. Later he explained to the Sahaba that there was no other reason except that during Salah, I remembered that I had a golden nugget, a very small one, of the wealth of Sadaqah inside the house, not of his wealth. And he said, I did not want the night to fall on the family of the Messenger of Allah in his home, whilst there was a piece of gold in the house, even though it didn't belong to him. So I went and I immediately instructed for its distribution. That's how he lived, that's how he wanted his family to live. What concerned him was their ibadah and their prayer, just as he did with Sayyidina Ali and Fatima radiyallahu anhuma. And with his wives as well, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi relates a hadith that one night suddenly the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam woke up and he said, Subhanallah, what trials have been sent down this night? And he mentioned a few other things. Then he said, Wake up the inhabitants of the chambers, referring to his wives. Wake up the inhabitants of the chambers, meaning the wives. I wake them up for the Hajj Salah. For he said, There is many a clothed woman in the world who shall be unclothed in the hereafter. And he said that in relation to his wives. That wake them up, i.e., for the Hajjad Salah, for prayer. For there are men, for there is many, a clothed woman in the dunya who shall be unclothed in the hereafter. So he would, and Umm al Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha relates that when the final 10 days of Ramadan would arrive, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would fasten his girdle, tighten his belt, he would wake up. Sorry, he would give life to his whole night, meaning in vigil and in prayer, and shed the mitzara wa ahya layla wa aqad ahla, and he would awaken his whole family. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would spend as much time in the dhikr and ibadah of Allah, and that's what he would do with his family as well. That was his life. I began the whole dars by speaking about how the Prophet وسلم, was in tune with nature. And this is just the first part. He would fall asleep immediately after Isha. That was his noble sunnah. He wouldn't spend time discussing and talking with his family. No. He would fall asleep. And then he would rise early. Abdullah ibn Abbas, anhuma, he specifically sought permission to stay overnight with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in order to observe what he did in his privacy. And we learn of how he would pray the Hajjad. So Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah, his auntie, Maymunah radiallahu anha. I mentioned last week how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was seated with Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah and to, the, to his right, uh, and to the left were the shuyukh of the Quraysh, the senior ones, both middle aged as well as much older. And one of the shuyukh was Abdullah ibn Abbas's cousin brother, Khalid ibn al Walid. There's a huge age gap between them because Abdullah ibn Abbas عنهما, was 14 when the Prophet وسلم, passed away, and Khalid ibn al Walid was much, much older. But they were cousin brothers. Their mothers were sisters. So Abdullah ibn Abbas's mother, Umm al-Fadl, and Maymunah radiallahu anha were sisters. And the third sister was Khalid ibn al-Walid's mother. So these were three sisters. So Khalid ibn al-Walid's auntie was Maymunah radiallahu anha as well. But Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, his auntie was Maymunah radiallahu anha, and he sought permission from her that, can you ask the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if I can stay with you overnight? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam granted permission. So Abdullah ibn Abbas delightedly relates how he slept and at night. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, there was a long pillar. 
So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and my auntie Maymuna radiyallahu anha, they both slept in such a way that the pillow was behind them. So here's a pillow, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Maymuna radiyallahu anha. And the narrow part of the pillow, i.e. to the side, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu slept like that. So he shared the pillow with his auntie, with his... Uh, with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam awoke, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, this young man who at such a young age was filled with zeal for learning. So much so that there was no inhibition. He respectfully asked his auntie, can I stay with you at home? Why? Just so that he could observe the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, follow his example, and Allah reward him immensely. Indeed, because of him, we learn of the private moments of the Prophet ﷺ at home at night. So he was alert. As soon as the Prophet ﷺ awoke, he awoke. But with some delay, because Prophet ﷺ got up. Abdullah ibn Abbas got up. He listened to the verses that the Messenger وسلم, read. He looked up towards the heavens and then began reading in the Fi Khalq al Samawati wal Ardi wa Khtilaf al Layl till the end of the verse. Then he got up, did wudu from a skin, water skin that was hung from the wall, and then he went and stood in Salah. Abdullah ibn Abbas did the same, and then he went and stood next to the Prophet. وسلم. Prophet وسلم, placed his noble hands on his head, turned his ears. <laughs> and brought him round so that he could stand to his right. And then he prayed with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whilst the family slept. So indeed on occasions he would wake his family, but often the family would be asleep. The world would be asleep. Rasulullah Alaihi Salatu Wasallam would be engaged in Salah in the early hours of the night. That was his timing. Aisha radiallahu anha says, and they lived simply, he had a small hut, small homes, no many rooms, each wife had one chamber, and the chambers were so short in height, so small, there is an estimation that approximately, approximately, the whole chamber, we're not talking about one room, but the entire quarter for each wife was about 15 square feet. So, sorry, um, yes, 15 square feet. So, five meters, five meters. That was the whole chamber, the entire quarter, and that contained everything. And the Prophet ﷺ lived his life in that manner. He lived a life of simplicity. That famous story of Abu Talha al-Ansari radiyallahu anh. Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha says, Never for two days in a row, never for two consecutive days, did the Prophet ﷺ ever eat barley. So they would mainly eat barley. If he... If you want to be healthy and live healthy, follow the diet and the sleeping pattern of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Truly. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he, if he would eat all this talk about carbs and protein, so if any carbs he would eat, he would be barley. But even then, on occasion, he loved meat, but that's no reason for excessive consumption. Because Aisha radiallahu anha relates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as well as they, the family, would only occasionally and rarely receive meat. In one hadith of Bukhari, she says, for two whole months, for two whole months, the fire in the hearth of the home of the Messenger of Allah would not be lit because there was no solid food to cook. For two whole months. All our food was dates and water for two months. And occasionally we would receive a gift of milk. That's why when they would have meat, 
Prophet ﷺ loved meat. But Aisha radiallahu anha herself explains in one hadith that he would only occasionally come to them. This is why he loved meat. So in this hadith, Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha says that for two consecutive days, never would the Prophet ﷺ, never did the Prophet ﷺ eat his fill from barley for two consecutive days until the day he left this world. And in another hadith related by other Sahaba radiallahu anhum, never did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fill his stomach. Never did he eat to his fill from barley or for meat, from meat, unless he was a guest with other people. So if he was eating with other people as a guest, then maybe he would eat a bit more. But normally he would never eat to his fill. So he lived simply. That famous story about Abu Talha al-Ansari radiyallahu an. This was his family life. So Abu Huraira radiyallahu an relates a hadith. And the guest was Abu Huraira himself, although it's not mentioned. But we learn from other narrations. So he say Abu Talha al-Ansari radiyallahu an. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one night after Isha salah he stood up and he called one of the attendants and he said, go and ask the wives of the Messenger of Allah if there is any food in any of the homes for the guest of the Messenger of Allah. So the attendant went. He went to each house of the Prophet ﷺ, all of these wives. And each wife said, please convey our salam to the Messenger of Allah and inform him that there is nothing in the home except water. And that was all the wives. Then the Prophet ﷺ made an announcement that who is there who will entertain the guest of the Messenger of Allah this night? So Abu Talha al-Ansari radiallahu an stood up. And he then took the guest who was Abu Huraira radiallahu an to his house. And that's another famous story in itself. So. This is how simply the family lived. And this was his life at home. And at home, of course, he had a special relationship with his wives, which I may touch upon now, and, but this, this, this requires many sessions. The Prophet Wasallam's marriages, his behavior with his wives, how he lived with them, how he treated them. That's another topic in itself. But at home, how was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He was at home as he was outside. There was no difference. Balance. I spoke earlier that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a very balanced individual. And that balance meant that the way the Messenger of Allah lived and behaved outside, that's how he lived and behaved at home. There was no difference. There are many mice at home who are lions outside, and there are many lions at home who are mice outside. That's human nature. We put on a show. We put on a cloak and a mask. We put on a persona. In fact, the very word person means a mask. The word, not persona, but the word person. Person means a mask. That's why in traditional plays, the actors are known as personae. Because that's what it means. Personae means the actors. So person means a mask because they are the actors. So when we're outside, we put on a persona, we put on a mask, a cloak. We change our speech, our behavior, our mannerisms, our demeanor, everything. And consciously, and sometimes subconsciously. But as soon as we return home, the cloak falls off. The mask falls off. And we reveal ourselves to our closest members of the family. This is why and we're not even talking about spouses. Sometimes spouses, yes, but 
immediate members of the family, the parents, the children, the brothers. For how long can a person keep up their act? They have to let go sometime. And that's when we normally let go in the privacy of our homes. Therefore, we are different people. And this is true for everybody. Sometimes, if you speak to a family member, and they relate how a person behaves at home, you can never connect the two. You can never believe that this is the same individual. And this is the unique nature of the Prophet of Allah And especially of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They treated him not only as a husband, but as a messenger of Allah. Indeed, they treated him as a messenger of Allah. And that reveals something. Because they saw him throughout the day, they saw him all the time. And yet, they were never disillusioned. They were never in doubt. They were never disenchanted with the Messenger of Allah. His glory, his miraculous nature, his majesty remained consistent with them, for them throughout their lives. Never did they suffer or waver in that manner. Never. And that is one of the miracles of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His marriages were miracles. They truly were. When we look at ourselves, our spouses, our wives know everything about us. No man can claim to be a saint as far as his wife is concerned. She'll remind you of all your saintliness if you ever make such a bold claim. And she will demolish all claims to your saintliness. She really will. With the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not one wife, not two wives, not three, at one and the same time, nine wives, not a single one of them dissented or ever revealed or ever conveyed or related a single thing of his private life which contradicted his public life. Never once. Just as the Sahaba radiallahu anhum honoured him and revered him, they honoured him and revered him. Umm Habiba radiallahu anha, whose name was Ramla, the daughter of Abu Sufyan. Imagine Abu Sufyan, his own daughter. Again, this was another miraculous thing about the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His bitterest enemies... Their daughters married him. Hay ibn Akhtab was the leader of Banu Nadir in Medina, one of the earlier tribes to be expelled from Medina. And he was a bitter opponent of the Messenger of Allah. He was the one who actually he went to live in Khaybar. And he was the one who instigated the Quraysh and tried to arouse them. especially in the later battles, and especially in the fifth year of Hijrah, when he also tried to instigate Banu Quraidha to betray the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from inside the city of Medina. So Hayy ibn Akhtab, eventually his daughter, Safiya radiyallahu anha, she married the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Sufyan, the leader of Medina, his daughter, Ramla, she embraced Islam, did Hijrah to Abyssinia, Habasha, and there she, she lived. She was married to the brother of Zainab bin Tujahsh, radiyallahu anha, Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh, radiyallahu an. And he then, they both did Hijrah to Habasha, and there they resided. And he passed away. Some of you may be surprised that I said Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh radiyallahu an, because it's reported that Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh radiyallahu an became, he renounced his faith and he became an apostate. 
But these reports about Ubaidullah ibn Jahash radiallahu an, a number of ulama have cast serious doubt on them. When you look at all the evidence, there are single reports of him passing away as a non-Muslim. And yet everything else about him that we know of authentic reports suggests otherwise. His hijra, his sacrifice, his being married to Zainab bin, his, mar- his being married to uh, Ramla bin to Abi Sufyan, his being the brother of uh, Zainab bin to Jahsh and Abdullah ibn Jahsh radiallahu anhum ajma'een. All of this suggests that that singular report about him, uh, because the it's not just that he died as a non-Muslim, but that he took to drinking and that he became an apostate. That report, many ulama have cast doubt on it. So when you contrast that singular, unreliable report with everything else that we know about him, it doesn't stand scrutiny. So she was married to Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh radiallahu an, but he passed away and then uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam proposed to her from Medina, she accepted the proposal. Najashi, who was the Abyssinian ruler, he actually performed their nikah, and he gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he gave her dowry on behalf of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa So, and the, her dowry was 400 dinar, along with other gifts, and that was a huge dowry. The other wives, she would boast that she had the most expensive dowry. The other wives were all given 500 dirhams. Ali gave 480 dirhams to Fatima. Anha. And although often it's, uh, people like to give the mahr of Fatima, anha, the mahr of Fatima radiyallahu anha at the time of the nikah was what Ali radiyallahu an gave Fatima radiyallahu anha. So in a way that's sunnah of Ali radiyallahu an. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had a mahr which he would give to all of his wives. And that was the sunnah mahr of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's slightly more than the mahr of Fatima radiyallahu anha. But uh, the other wives were given 500 dirhams which is 12 and a half uqiyah. But the the mahr, the dowry of Ramla radiallahu anha was 400 dinar, not dirham, 400 dinars, gold sovereigns. And that was given by Najashi. In any case, she married the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in absentia. And then when she came to Medina, she lived with him later. But she, she had never seen her father for all those years since the time she emigrated to Abyssinia. Then in the seventh year of Hijrah, he came to Medina in order to ratify the treaty after the allies of the Quraysh attacked the allies of the Muslims. The Banu Bakr, they attacked the Banu Khuza'ah. And Abu Sufyan was now fearful that the Treaty of Hudaybiyah would now be rendered null and void, and he was in a fearful state. So he came to Medina to ratify the treaty. When he came to Medina, he decided to visit his daughter, Ramla. This was the first time after so many years. And when he went to visit her, I relate this because I said earlier, how did the wives view the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Everything they saw about him, from him. So when he went to see her, this is now the father visiting his daughter for the first time after many, many years. Approximately, approximately 15 years. He's now seeing his daughter for the first time after 15 years. He enters the house. They greet one another. He then goes to sit down. As he is lowering himself, she suddenly pulls the bedding from underneath him. And he stops midway. And he was eloquent. So he said to her, 
Oh, my daughter, I don't understand. He didn't say, I don't understand, that's my paraphrasing in English. But he said to her, oh, my daughter, did you remove the bedding from under me? Because the bedding is too good for me or I am too good for the bedding? So this is a daughter speaking to the father. I won't repeat the entire sentence. But she said, O oh father, this is the bedding of the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you are impure. She refused to allow her own father to sit on the firash and the bedding of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he then stood up again and he looked at her and he said, لَقَدْ أَصَابَكِ شَرٌ بَعْدَ الْإِسْلَامِ That after embracing Islam, some evil has touched you. And then he left. But that was how the wives viewed the Messenger of Allah. Imagine how balanced and perfect an individual he must have been at home. He was patient with them. He respected the wives. He tried to please them. Allah says that in the Quran. But in, with balance. With balance. <coughs> Allah says, Ya ayyuhal nabiyyu lima tuharrimu ma ahallahu lak tabdaghi mardata azwajik. That, O oh Prophet, why do you make halal upon why do you make haram upon yourself that which Allah has made halal why tabdaghi mardata azwajik seeking the pleasure of your wives that's how the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was he was very soft very compassionate very understanding he would hardly get angry with his wives hardly He was very tolerant, very patient, Allahu Akbar, extremely patient. And like I said, this deserves another topic in its entirety. He would respect them. Again, this is something I, I mentioned last week. That's something unique about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his relationship with children. He respected children. Not only did he show them love, compassion, mercy, affection, remarkably, the Prophet ﷺ showed respect to children. See how he respected Abdullah ibn Abbas See how he respected Anas ibn Malik even though they were young children. Similarly, the Prophet ﷺ showed love and affection towards his wives. But, remarkably, he showed great respect. The respect he had for Umm al-Mu'mineen Khadija radiyallahu anha. The respect he had for all of his wives. It's remarkable. Many men today would balk at such things. We think it's manliness to speak down to our wives, to hold them in contempt, to put them in, in their place, to be harsh towards them, to treat them harshly in order to get things done, in order to achieve things, to speak to them boldly and irreverently. Rasulullah along with his love, along with his affection, the remarkable and unique thing you will discover in his relationship with his own wives was respect. They revered him, but he respected them too. Safiya radiyallahu anha, the daughter of Uyi ibn Akhtab, about whom I've just said a few words. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in order to help her climb the camel, he actually knelt on the ground with one knee and raised the other knee so that Safiya radiyallahu anha could use his thigh as a stepping stone, as a stepping stool, in order to climb onto the camel. So the Prophet wasallam knelt down, and Umm al-Mu'mineen Safiya radiyallahu anha climbed on his thigh and then onto the camel. 
that was chivalrous. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam respected Khadija radiyallahu anha immensely. They were in a position to console him when he received wahi. Who did he go to for consolation, for advice, for help, for guidance to, as to what he should do? Who did he go to for support? He didn't go to any family member. He did not go to a friend. He was fearful. He was filled with fright. Yet the only person who he went to was Umm al-Mu'mineen Khadija radiyallahu anha. And Khadija radiyallahu anha, because of her relationship with him, was in a position to comfort him, to console him. He rushed home, he said, throw cold water on me. Dathiruni, zammiluni. Cover me with a cloak. Wrap me in a blanket. Throw cold water on me. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was then comforted and consoled by none other than Umm al-Mu'mineen Khadija radiyallahu anha. And she said some remarkable words to him. And those words were not just flattery. They were not just full of empty praise. Umm al-Mu'mineen Khadija radiyallahu anha in very succinctly and eloquently described the whole character of the Messenger of Allah. To reassure him, the wife, Umm al-Mu'mineen Khadija radiyallahu anha, reassured the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the critical moment when he first met Jibreel alayhi salam. That was a position she enjoyed. And he always remembered her position. To the extent that when he would slaughter an animal, he would actually cut, cut up the meat and he would send it to the friends of Umm al-Mu'mineen Khadija radiyallahu anha. Long after her death, long after her death, much to the ayah and to the irksomeness of Aisha radiyallahu anha, she would always protest. She herself relates that he remembered her so much, he would mention her so much, that even when he slaughtered animals who would distribute meat to her friends. Not just her family, but her friends. And then Aisha radiallahu anha would say things about Umm al-Mu'mineen Khadija radiallahu anha. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his balance, he was so balanced, he wouldn't just remain silent. He would defend Umm al-Mu'mineen Khadija radiallahu anha without saying anything to Aisha radiallahu anha. And he did that with all of his wives. They, they lived a normal life. They were women, they were ladies. The Prophet ﷺ was their husband. They fought, they bickered, they argued, they, <coughs> in the wording of one hadith, they threw dust at one another in their arguments. They shouted at each other. They raised their, they not just raised their voices at one another, they shouted at each other, they argued with one another, they broke one another's utensils and cups and bowls. They did all sorts of things. Because that was their, that was the nature of jealousy. But at the same time, they were full of taqwa. The chief rival of Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha was Zainab bint Jahsh. She was a chief rival. Eloquent. Beautiful. Noble. A woman of great standing and intelligence and piety. And despite their bickering, despite and they would argue to such a degree that speaking of the family life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we learn from Bukhari, so hadith of Bukhari, that, um, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum knew of his love and affection for Aisha radiallahu anha. <coughs> And the other wives were jealous of that. So they would, in order to win the heart of the Messenger of Allah, they would reserve their gifts for that day when the Prophet ﷺ would be with Aisha radiallahu anha. So they wouldn't give him a gift on the other days, they'd give it when he was with the Pro uh, Aisha radiallahu anha. So the other wives would argue and say, we are his wives too. Why, does he get, why do they send gifts only on her day? 
We, we demand that the Messenger of Allah establish justice between us and that he instructs the companions to send gifts equally to all the wives and to all the homes of the wives whenever the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is with them, wherever he may be. So there were two groups amongst them. And in one group was Zainab bint Jahsh and Umm Salama radiyallahu anhuma. So the wives nominated Umm Salama radiyallahu anhuma, radiyallahu anha. So she, like, you speak to the Messenger of Allah. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi she was older, she was wise, she was very intelligent, as we learned from Hudaybiyah. So she spoke to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Messenger of Allah, the wives of your wives. They demand justice. In, in fact, they wouldn't even call her Aisha. They would say, Bintu ibn Abi Quhafa, the daughter of Ibn Abi Quhafa. So they seek justice in relation to Aisha. Prophet Sallallahu kept quiet. He wouldn't scold them for telling him anything, he wouldn't reply to them. He remained silent. Umm Salama radiyallahu anha spoke to him again and again repeatedly, he remained silent. So the wives, then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told her, Umm Salama radiyallahu anha, that do not hurt me in relation to Aisha. She said, I repent to Allah and to his messenger. I, I seek his forgiveness. She told the rest of the wives, so the wives said, you haven't done anything for us. So they then nominated Fatima radiyallahu anha, his daughter. Fatima radiyallahu anha went to the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was actually lying in bed with Aisha radiyallahu anha, covered in a blanket. Fatima radiyallahu anha walked in. He, she sought permission. He gave her permission to enter. This shows that it's entirely permissible for husband and wife to be in bed, covered, blankets, and for family members to enter the bedroom, it doesn't matter. So, Fatima radiyallahu anha entered. She spoke to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said to her, Fatima, if you love me, love her. Fatima radiyallahu anha went, and the wife said, she hasn't done anything. They then sent their chief advocate, the leader of, well, not the lead, possibly the leader of the group, but the chief rival, Zainab bint Jahsh radiyallahu anha. She came. She came to the chamber. And she then spoke to the Messenger of Allah, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we demand justice in relation to bint ibn Abi Quhafa. And then. She turned to Aisha radiyallahu anha and she began saying whatever she said. She abused her. She said whatever she wanted to. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never said anything. Aisha radiyallahu anha continued to listen. And then she says herself that I continue to wait for some signal from the Messenger of Allah that he would grant me permission to reply and say something in my defense. Eventually, the Prophet ﷺ signaled to her. So Aisha radiyallahu anha began replying. And Aisha radiyallahu anha's own words were that I answered back in such a way that her saliva dried up in her throat. Her saliva dried up in her mouth and she fell silent. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the most he said was, إِنَّهَا لَبِنْتُ أَبِي بَكْرِ That after all, she is a daughter of Abu Bakr, meaning she's as eloquent as her father, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Despite their rivalry, Allahu Akbar, which was natural and to be expected. Aisha radiallahu anha says when she was falsely accused of a great sin, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his desperate desire to seek solace and comfort and reassurance, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke to family members. 
he spoke to Ali radiallahu an. He spoke to other family members. And then he also spoke to Zainab radiallahu an. Zainab bin Tujahsh. Aisha radiallahu anha says that she, Zainab, was my chief rival. She could have said anything on that occasion. Just as Ali radiallahu anhu said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he in his desire not to see the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam undergo any further pain and torment, he suggested to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of Allah, there are many other women apart from Aisha. I.e. He, he, he told him, why don't you divorce her and marry again? And in this way you would be relieved of this torture and torment. So, and he said it's for his own reasons, for in, in order to spare the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa any further torment. Zainab radiallahu anha could have said anything on that occasion, absolutely anything. And yet, and even though she was her chief rival, what did she say in reply? She said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, by Allah, I know nothing of Aisha except good. Allahu Akbar. And Aisha radiallahu anha says about Zainab bin Tujahsh radiallahu anha that she was my chief rival who would compete with me with the Messenger of Allah. But her taqwa saved her. She actually says that her taqwa saved her. So she testifies. She didn't just say, oh, this time she kept quiet. She praised Zainab radiallahu anha and said of her that she had taqwa. Her wara, her fear of Allah and her taqwa protected her. When Umm Habiba radiallahu anha, the daughter of Abu Sufyan Ramla, when she died, she called all the remaining family members of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa meaning the wives, on her deathbed. She called them, all her co-wives, and she said to them, we were all wives of the messenger. And as is the norm, we had our differences. We had our disagreements and our conflicts. So, but now that I am about to depart, I wish to depart from this world in such a state that I am halal of you. Meaning, I do not wish to be anything, I do not wish for anything to remain outstanding between us that I forgive you all that has passed between us, and that you forgive me all that has passed between us. And all the remaining wives, she called them, she requested them to come to her. They all came to her deathbed. This was a conversation she had with every single one of them individually, and they all forgave each other before Ramla bint Abi Sufyan, Umm Habiba radiallahu anha, departed from this world. So yes, they had their rivalries, they had their arguments, they had bitter arguments, but... This was all understood to be expected, given the circumstances. But their taqwa never left them. Their fear of Allah reigned supreme. And the Prophet ﷺ, in all of this, his behavior was one of tolerance, absolute tolerance. No matter what they did, Abu Bakr was harsher than the Prophet ﷺ. Umar was harsher than the Prophet ﷺ. With the, with the Prophet's wives. He was. Umar radiallahu an says that we were a people from Mecca who would dominate their wives. We the Muhajirun, we came from Mecca and in Mecca we dominated our wives. Because in Mecca, it's well known, historically it was a patriarchal culture. In Medina, it was a matriarchal culture. The women were far, far more powerful. So, but when we came, when we did hijrah, we came to a people, meaning the Ansar, the Aus and the Khazraj, whose women dominated them. So our women began learning from the women of the Ansar. So the Ansari women were, well, the, uh, so according to Umar radiallahu and the Muhajirun dominated their women. And the Ansar, when they came to Medina, they found a people whose women dominated them. 
I often humorously ask my students, are you a Muhajir or an Ansari? So, although no one's ever given me a reply, but uh, if I ask you, are you an Ansari or a Muhajir, maybe humorously you can give me a reply, neither an Ansari or a Muhajir, I follow the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, balanced. But I doubt any of us can do that. So Umar radiallahu anhu says that, so our women began learning from their women. So one day I was engrossed in thought and I said something, so my wife answered back. So he scolded her, how dare you? You speak back to me? So his wife said, oh, oh Ibn al-Khattab, you, you find it strange that I answer back to you? When the wives of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speak back to him, in fact some of them, they give him the silent treatment, they refuse to speak to him for the whole day. So he said, truly they have lost and perished if that is the case. Then he went to see Hafsa radiallahu anha, warned her. He went to Umm Salama radiallahu anha. The reason he went to Umm Salama radiallahu anha is that Umm Salama radiallahu anha was related to him, so he could speak to her. So he went to Umm Salama radiallahu anha. Umm Salama radiallahu anha being Umm Salama, she said to him, Oh Umar, isn't it enough that you interfere in everybody else's lives, that you even begin interfering in the marriages of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So he fell silent. He went away. So Umar radiallahu anhu was harsher than Abu, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in relation to his wife. Even Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Once the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was with Aisha radiallahu anha, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu walked past. And he heard his daughter raising her voice to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came in and he went for his daughter. He lunged at her. And he said, how dare you raise your voice to the Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam intervened and came in between them. And he shielded, Abu, he shielded Aisha radiallahu anha from her father. Abu Bakr radiallahu anha left in anger. Aisha radiallahu anha feared her father more than he, she feared her husband. She truly did. On one occasion, I'll conclude this hadith in a moment, but on one occasion, uh, when they were gathered, in one of the homes, they were, they were gathered in the home of Aisha radiallahu anha. So the Prophet sallallahu the other wives were there, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam extended his hand and Aisha radiallahu anha, towards Zainab bint Jahsh, so Aisha radiallahu anha, she her chief rival, she suddenly exclaimed, that Zainab, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam withdrew his hand. So then Zainab and Aisha radiallahu anha began arguing. And they argued and argued. This was just before Isha Salah. And whilst they were arguing, in one narration, this is what I said, in, one, in the wording of one narration of this hadith, they argued to the extent that they picked up dust and th began throwing it at one another. So Abu Bakr radiallahu the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was silent. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu walked past. When he saw all of this, he accompany the Messenger of Allah and said, oh, Messenger of Allah, leave them and let's go for Salah. So he took her, took, he took him to Salah. Aisha radiallahu anha, as soon as she saw her father come and take the Messenger of Allah to Salah, she began fearing. And she actually said to the other wives that now you watch, my father will come, Abu Bakr will come after Salah and he'll say this to me and he'll say that to me and he'll say this to me and he'll say that to me and true to her word straight after Salah Abu Bakr radiallahu anh came back alone and he scolded her how dare you is this what you do is this what you do so she feared her father more than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam so on that occasion she was raising her voice Abu Bakr radiallahu anh came he lunged at her Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam shielded her and then Abu Bakr radiallahu anh left in anger so the Prophet وسلم, remarkably, he said to her, see how I saved you from your father. <laughs> so they, they then began laughing and joking with one another. So Abu Bakr came back later and he heard them laughing and joking. So he came in. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, why don't both of you include me in your peace just as you included me in your war? So... 
the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very forbearing and patient. Abu Bakr radiallahu an, Umar radiallahu an were harsher than he was. But that should be no reason for anyone to take advantage. Never the wives of the Messenger of Allah. These were on some, this was on some occasions. Otherwise they revered him, not as a husband, but as a Messenger of Allah. They would collect his perspiration, his sweat, and use it as perfume. They would drink his leftover water for barakah. For barakah. And there are countless other examples. There's so much to say. As far as his marriages are concerned, inshallah, I'll speak about that on another occasion. Speaking about his family life, I'll end with just one thing. Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha narrates in a hadith later by Imam Bukhari, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal in his mustad, a number of narrations. That Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha was asked, what would the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do at home? What, what did he used to do at home? So Aisha radiyallahu anha replied by saying, kana fi mihnat ahli. فَإِذَا حَضَرَتِ الصَّلَاةِ خَرَجَ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ This is a narration of Bukhari. That the Prophet وسلم, would be preoccupied in the mihna of his family. And the meaning of mihna is khidma. Not mihna with a ha, mihna with a ha. كَانَ فِي مِهْنَةِ أَهْلِهِ And the meaning of mihna is khidma. So this means Aisha radiallahu anha says when she was asked what would the messenger of Allah do in the privacy of his home? She says he would be preoccupied in the khidmah of his family. He would serve his family. He would do household chores. He would help. He would look after himself. And in one narration related by Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, she says he would do what men do at home. What men do. He would do what men do. That means true men. Men like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum. And what would he do at home? Allahu Akbar. She says, and I, I say this from a number of narrations, he used to milk the goats himself. He used to milk the goats. He used to repair his own shoes and sandals. He used to de-lice his clothes. Remove lice from his clothes. He would patch and stitch his own clothes. He would do all of this. And in general, she says, He would serve himself. He wouldn't issue commands for others to do things for him. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would do things for himself. Even at home, he wouldn't expect his family to do it. And he would be preoccupied in the khidmah of his family, helping them, assisting them, carrying out chores. We think that this is unmanly. This is very cultural. Very cultural. It's, it's our culture where we expect the man to do... It's remarkable, you look at different cultures. And in some cultures, it's considered an insult for the man to do absolutely anything. Even shopping. And the Prophet wasallam would shop. He was a messenger of Allah, but he would shop in the marketplace. He would go out to shop. As normal. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum would do the same. In fact, the Quraysh, this is one of the things they picked on. They said, what kind of messenger is this? They wanted an angel to come down from the heavens. So they said, in Mecca, مَا لِهَذَا الرَّسُولِ يَأْكُلُ الطَّعَامُ وَيَمْشِي فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ What kind of messenger is this? Who eats food and who walks in the marketplace. So if you ever see me in the shires, don't complain. <laughs> So they said, What kind of messenger is this that he eats food and he walks in the marketplace? He would go out for shopping. He'd work at home, he'd carry out his chores. He'd serve himself, he'd serve his family. 
when it was Salah time, then he'd leave. There is nothing unmanly about any of this. And when people complain of Islamic behaviour by looking at certain cultures and seeing the men doing nothing and the women doing everything, in some cultures the women do the shopping, the cooking, the cleaning, the raising, the upbringing, the nurturing, the teaching, the educating, the driving, the shopping, everything. So what does a man do? Nothing. Sits all day eating and drinking. And I've had so many experiences. Sometimes I've actually laughed out loud when people have contacted me because it's just unbelievable. I remember one conversation where this young lady rang me, and this is one occasion when I was much younger then and I couldn't contain myself, and I laughed. Not because it was funny, but it was tragic. And I'd, She was explaining about her life. Allah Akbar, this young woman, this young lady... Here in this country, she was holding down two jobs, looking after her parents, cooking, cleaning, earning, doing everything. And when she went through the list of all that she did, I then actually asked her, incredulously, what does he do then? Because she was speaking about him, the problem she was having. And she laughed as well, and I burst out laughing, and she said... Wallahi Sheikh, he does nothing. He eats, he drinks, he sleeps, and all day long he sits watching TV. So in some cultures, that's all men do. I remember once, on one occasion, I went to someone's house for food. I was invited for a meal, so everybody was there. We sat down for a meal. So the son-in-law, son-in-law, so the father and the elder members of the family and his sons and others we all sat down for food. I was a guest and the son-in-law was sitting there and he had earrings on. And he sat there and I... He wouldn't eat. So I, I knew the fa I know the family well, so I said to them that, um, I said to the father, because I, I get on very humorously with him, I said, why won't he eat? I said, sit down. He said, no, no, no. I said, sit down. So I thought maybe out of respect or inhibition, I don't know. So I said to the father, uh, tell him to sit. No, it's all right. Uh, he'll eat afterwards. So said, okay. Then afterwards, the father told me. He laughed in private. He told me, he says, my son-in-law. Imagine how tragic this is. The father has to relate this about his own daughter. Because that was his son-in-law. He said, the reason he doesn't eat, he never <coughs> eats, is because he never eats with anyone. He eats alone. And the way he eats is that he lies... Uh, this isn't uh, in a village somewhere else. This is here in this country. <laughs> so he says he lies down, and the only picture I can imagine is one of these... Roman emperors, where they lie down on a couch with one uh, knee, with one el leaning on one elbow, and he actually does that. So he lies down on a couch, leaning on one elbow, and his wife sits in front of him and feeds him every morsel in his mouth. And he doesn't work, he doesn't work, he doesn't earn, he doesn't do anything. Well, he never used to then. And he couldn't even feed himself. So she would sit down on the floor whilst he's reclining on this couch, leaning on one elbow, and she's actually feeding him. And um, this, this, is, this is a father's testimony. This is a father's testimony. And remarkably, he doesn't even have his own place. He lives with his father anymore. So... It's considered unmanly for a man to do any chores in some cultures. Remember, that's cultural. As far as Rasulullah was concerned, there was no one, no one more valiant, more courageous, more manly, stronger, more balanced than the Messenger of Allah. And yet, he would stitch his clothes, delouse his clothes, patch his sandals, patch his clothes repair his sandals, he would milk the goat, he would serve himself, he would serve his family. I end with this, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us all to understand 
There is so much more that can be said about the family and household life of the Messenger of Allah. I've taken a bit of time, I suffice with this. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasooli nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.